Going solar brings a cheaper energy bill, but SDG&E says it's gone too far. Now the utility wants a major hike on its minimum payments. It's a project that sickened students, but it didn't have to. How San Diego State University mistakenly rushed through repairs at one of its buildings on campus. And a breakthrough for the San Diego Zoo's Safari Park. Why one rhino's birth could help save an entire species. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, reporter Matt Hoffman of KPBS News, Eric Anderson, environment reporter for KPBS News, and reporting intern Bella Ross of iNewsource. Well, file this under no good deed goes unpunished. Tens of thousands of environmentally conscious San Diegans have switched to rooftop solar power. So many are switching that San Diego Gas and Electric wants to boost its minimum bill to customers, buy a lot. And Matt, start there with the specifics of this proposal. What do they want to do? Right, so right now, SDG has a minimum bill amount for customers that's $10 a month. They want to increase that to $38 a month. And basically, they say the biggest reason that they need to do this is that this influx of solar customers, they have about 160,000 uh, households on solar right now. And they say that they're just not paying their full uh, their full share in terms of using the grid. Um, if they, even if they're putting credits back onto the grid in terms of solar or um, when, they're not, when they're not using solar, they're just not paying their fair share and they're saying that people who don't have solar, which is about 88% of their customers, are having to subsidize them for their access to the grid. Okay, so I, I, have, I happen to have solar, but those of us who have solar, we're not using ener energy because our system is enough to cover all our energy needs, but we're right. still paying that $10 a month right now to, to support the infrastructure, the, the grid itself, and you're saying that's going to almost quadruple. Well, and, and I think it's it's fair to say that this is just an ask from SDG. Just a proposal. Yeah, it's just a proposal. I mean, the California Public Utilities Commission could they could reject it completely, um, but usually they usually meet somewhere in, in the middle here. Um, but yeah, your bill, if you right now, if you have a zero dollar bill, or if you have like a, some people have a twenty dollar bill on solar, it could go up if they get what they want. All right. So not surprisingly, uh, critics were uh, quick to respond. We've got a, a bright, uh, excuse me, a bite here. Nicole Capritz, executive director of the Climate Action Campaign. Let's hear from her. It's just a pure power grab. I mean, they, they want to squash competition. They don't want people to install rooftop solar. They don't want people to make their homes energy efficient. They do want to encourage even more energy use. And unfortunately, they want to make maximize profit at our expense, and it's unacceptable. All right, and we're going to go right back into another uh, clip here. This is from sdg e spokesman Wes Jones, uh, his response. This proposal, minimum bill amounts, and even the fixed charge, uh, part, part of that proposal, this is revenue neutral. This company will not make more money as a result of those proposals. This is about equity. This is about making sure, regardless of the customer type, everybody's paying their fair share to access the grid. All right, so there's going to be some real debate on that in terms of everybody paying their fair share versus, because this is a for-profit company. This right. is a, a company that's making money for their shareholders, right? Right, yeah, and as you heard sdg &E say, they, they claim that this is revenue neutral, so they're saying it's not a hike, it's just all about equity is, is, is what they keep saying. They say right now there's a, a $400 million cost shift from solar to non-solar, meaning they're saying that solar customers are underpaying about $400 million per year. They said in 2013 that was about $200 million, but as more solar customers have come on, they say that that cost shift has gone a lot higher. Eric? And how did they get to the $400 million number? How, how do you determine how much the cost of hooking up to the grid actually is? Right, so SCG News says they have a minimum cost for each customer. Um, they say the average customer is about $90 to access the grid that's not solar. Uh, we've asked them for details about that $400 million number. After we did the story this week, we heard a lot of pushback from solar companies saying that's like $2,500 per household they're, they're saying annually are underpaying um, for their access to, to the grid. Uh, sdg &E, they're currently working to get back to us on that, um, but they do say that they have a methodology of how they calculate that. So if, if a customer is paying their electricity bill based on the amount of electricity that they use, um, isn't the cost of the grid figured into that, that transaction? Uh, isn't it already included, something that the PUC is 
is looked at? Right, and, and that, that's what that $10 minimum bill was before, and apparently this had gone to the CPUC, and they said that the $10 bill is, is that's, that's enough for these people to cover the costs. But SCG &E says that that's changing now. With a lot more people going, going solar, they're saying that, there's, that they're not paying into um, to, 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 to support the grid, basically. They're saying that that's changing and that $10 minimum needs to go up. It's also worth noting, too, that this might not just impact solar customers. I mean, there's people. Yeah, I was going to say, besides uh, solar, I mean, th these are the folks who you would expect would, would see their bills rise under this proposal. Right, yeah, I mean, you talk to solar people who have like $19 bills, $15 bills, some have $0 bills. Zero. Because they put, yeah, they put credits back on. Um, but there's also people um, who live in like small apartments who have a $30 bill or who have a $25 bill. Um, now, that is low. Uh, but SDG &E says if this proposal were to go in their favor, if it were to go into effect the $38 minimum bill, they say at least 20% of customers would see a, a bill increase. And again, we're just talking about electric bills here because the, there's a G in there too, there's gas. Right. Somebody like me, even though I have solar, I've got a lot of gas appliances too, so you're paying for obviously the use of natural yeah, gas. And we, yeah, we are, we're just talking about solar um, and uh, with there's a lot of, lots of batteries coming on now, because basically when you have solar, you still have to be connected to the grid usually because you just get solar during the day. There's but, rainy days. Right, there's rainy days, there's cloudy days at night, you have to use the grid. It gets dark sometimes, yeah. I mean, if you had a battery and you went off the grid, then you wouldn't have to deal with SDG and SDG &E at all, hypothetically. Um, but they're saying to still be connected to the grid, whether you're giving power or taking power, they're saying that those costs are going up. Now, uh, SDG and E has higher rates than California's other two main utilities, and we're about as high as any place in the nation, are we not? Right, yeah, and I talked to SDG and E today, actually, and they, they definitely acknowledge that they have some of the highest rates um, in, in California, uh, and they say that, I mean, they, they list off a number of things of why they say that is. They say they've invested over the last 10 years over a billion dollars in, in fire prevention. They say that a lot of their lines are, are underground, which is a lot more expensive. They have a smaller customer base here in San Diego, so the disbursement of the rates has to be higher. Um, and they say that also that they use a lot of renewables. I think 45% uh, of scg &E's power is renewable right now, and they say that that's more expensive. So they're, that's how they're kind of justifying why these rates are so high. Now the whole uh, issue of community choice, we've talked about that uh, on this show before. It's been backed by uh, San Diego Mayor Kevin Faulkner uh, and critics of utility are pushing for that. Uh, just give us the, the thumbnail on that. Yeah, th there's a lot of cities right now that are looking at community choice energy. Uh, community choice energy or community choice aggregation, CCE or CCA. Unfortunate name. Yeah, you know. unfortunate <laughs> name, they're a little complicated. <laughs> Basically it's for like a local municipality um, would control the buying um, and selling of electricity. Um, right now, Solana Beach has formed uh, a CCE, um, and so that, that introduces competition to the market. That's why you see people like the Climate Action Campaign saying, if we have these um, community choice energies, uh, these companies come in, well, not, not companies, it's more like nonprofits that are created, like the city of San Diego, Chula Vista, they're looking to make a JPA, a joint powers agreement, where they could serve more customers. Basically, it introduces competition to the market, um, and they can provide different incentives because there's not, like you said, there's no shareholders for them. So they can put the money back, they can make sure that people who have solar bills stay lower. Okay. So does this mean that, that, that uh, SDG&E's entire business model that they've been operating under for the last 25 years is, is going out the window? Well, so, uh, and I think it's important to note too, so sdg &E, they don't make any money uh, on the billing uh, of, of electricity. They make their money um, on the distribution and the transmission of energy. Um, and so... And they get a guaranteed rate of return. They get a guaranteed rate of return on that. So, and that's why some critics are saying that they don't want solars because with solar, they say there's less infrastructure for the grid. Um, but SDG &E pushes back on that saying that, no, 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 even if you have solar, there's still grid infrastructure that needs to be paid for. Um, but yeah, you know, at SDG &E, they're not allowed to say whether they do or don't like CCEs, uh, according to the California Public Utilities Commission. They just say they support community choice, but you have to think that it's definitely going to give them competition. It might force them to lower rates, or they might not. Yeah, and as we talked about before on the show, they weren't crazy about <laughs> community choice. It kind of brought kicking and screaming to it. I should say they noted today that they're going to, uh, the utility said they're going to have a lot more charging stations for uh, buses and bigger uh, vehicles. They're encouraging electric uh, that way, and not just uh, for passenger cars and all. So, I mean, we're in the midst of a, a major shift here in California and a place like San Diego where we've got these clean energy plans and the shift to alternative and clean energy is, is happening. And, and it's affecting utilities from 
here to Europe. Right, and that's what sdg &E kind of says, that they're seeing this shift happening now. They say that they're definitely not the only utility that, that's seeing this. I know that there's a utility in Sacramento that's also pushing for a, a new minimum bill increase, so they're saying it's not just isolated to them. Uh, they do have some of the highest percentage of customers that are solar in the nation. They say about 12% right now, or 160,000. Almost out of time on this. Uh, what's the process uh, for, for this proposal, and how long will it take before we see what happens here? So right, right, right now it's going through the California Public Utilities Commission. They expect a decision um, in the first quarter of 2020, so that's about spring of 2020. I mean, like I said, this is an ask from SDG&E. Right. It's probably not what they're going to get. Usually they end up somewhere in the middle, but the CPUC, they could reject the entire proposal sure. and say stay at 10. All right, we'll be watching that one on a follow-up on that one. We're going to move on now. The race was on for renovating a building here on the campus of San Diego State University. Spend money on upgrades to the Professional Studies and Fine Arts building by June 30th of this year are risk losing $2 million in funding for a $2.5 million project. But that date was off by a year and the resulting race to renovate resulted in a project that went terribly wrong. So uh, Bella, start with that deadline. What did SDSU officials say about what they uh, thought, why they had to hurry? So there was this June 30th fund, funding deadline that you mentioned for part of the project's funds. The project was initially about a $2 million project and um, $500,000 of that was subject to this funding deadline that you mentioned. So um, there were a couple delays in how the project was being done. There were weather delays, they had issues getting the permits, and they were getting inching closer and closer to this funding deadline. And so that's kind of what ended, them, ended up forcing them to rush the project in the end because they were gonna lose some of the funds. But you know, as you mentioned, that funding deadline ended up being a year off. They didn't find this out until after the fact, so that ended up being, you know, another ripple and, you know, all of the issues that came with this project. And we're going to get into it, some of these details now, but I mean, that's just astounding when people say, how could you have missed this thing by a year? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't even really know how it happened. They just, they're telling us, you know, we thought it was one year and now that, it was after the deadline had already passed, they found out that it wasn't. So, you know, this real, this information really did come too late for them. Yeah, so in the interest of full disclosure, San Diego State holds the broadcasting license for KPBS. Tell us about this building, uh, Bella. How many floors, what's it used for? Why was the renovation project needed? So, you know, this building really touches everybody on campus. It's, um, it's a four-story building and um, its main purpose is housing the um, professional studies and fine arts school. So that includes the School of Journalism, Hospitality, Public Administration, and then on top of that, there's a small library in the building, a Chinese learning center. There's even some bio labs in the space. So it really does house a lot of people. Most people on campus end up in there at one point or another. And then, um, but you know, the building was built in the 50s. It's very old. And you know, people have said since this project started, you know, some of the issues that this building is seeing have been here for over 20 years now. So, and some of those issues, whether well, you had a leaky roof to begin with, right? Well, yeah, the leaky roof was, um, you know, it was a symptom of the project. It was a symptom of them doing this project incorrectly, but the roof was very old. There were some um, issues with the temperature in the building. Sometimes it was really hot, sometimes it was really cold. The bathrooms are really old. There's all kinds of issues, so. Really needed um, an upgrade. Yeah, yeah. This, this roofing project was part of, um, you know, a larger project to renovate um, the building and kind of bring it up to date. And ideally, you'd, of course, do this over summer when you've got the biggest break nobody's around, building shut down, and you can take your time and, and do this whole project right. Yeah, you know, that was the idea. Initially, it was supposed to be done last summer, and, um, you know, that didn't happen. They had some issues getting the permits that they needed in time, but they didn't want to do it during the school year when people were going to be in the building. It would have been a little bit too disruptive. So, you know, instead of... Um, postponing it until this next summer because of that funding deadline that we mentioned. They did it over winter break, but that's only a month. So, you know, they didn't really have the time that they needed. All right, so it's late January, wet winter. Students and faculty are back in this uh, professional studies and fine arts building. What happened? So they ended up having to use this new material because as you mentioned, the leaks in the roof, they um, were using a different material initially, but it was really rainy this winter, as many of you probably remember. and. It caused a lot of leaks in the building. So, so it's a material where you can patch in the rain. It, it, it's designed yes. to work with wet uh, surfaces. Yeah, so they you started using the new material and you know it was working to patch the roof, but it did create these really strong odors and they weren't leaving the building and because of the weather delays and having to use a new material, the project ended up getting delayed and they couldn't really stop it at this point. So they had to continue to do the work while people were in the building, which was initially something they were trying to avoid. And what are they complaining of at this point? Um, so yeah, the first day that they started using this new material, they immediately started getting complaints from people in the building and that included um, 
headaches, migraines, nosebleeds. Um, some people said they were vomiting. It really was all kinds of issues that people were seeing. And the university's response initially? Um, so they did test almost immediately um, in the building. They did some tests, but nothing was really coming up. And then, um, you know, throughout the next few weeks, they were really doing everything that they could to try to reduce the odors in the building, but nothing was working. Um, you know, I talked to an expert who was saying, normally you would do some kind of assessment to make sure that these issues wouldn't happen in the building. And we found out later that the fresh air vents for the building that bring in fresh air to the building were on the roof. So it was basically- The so proximity is right there to this material that's being used. Yeah, it was basically pumping this chemical vapors throughout the entire building and it made it really hard then to get those um, odors out. Right. And it's unfortunate Eric? it was in the School of Journalism, right? Uh, people started to, to talk about this. Uh, and in fact, uh, there were a couple of big public meetings as well, right? Yes, yeah, so that came a little bit later on, but um, yeah, I personally did have a number of classes in the building because it was um, the School of Journalism, and you can tell that things weren't quite right in the space. There was this really intense um, odor throughout the building for a couple months, and you know, some offices were closed, classes were getting relocated, um, but you know, at this point, we didn't really have any answers. Those public meetings came a little bit later on, and that's where we were finally able to get the information we needed. And there were some complaints uh, early on about transparency. What did the university officials you interviewed uh, finally say in hindsight? Now? So in hindsight, you know, they really did, um, it seems like the university really has recognized that the communication, the level of communication they offered um, to this project wasn't sufficient. People weren't notified about, the, or at least the whole campus community wasn't notified about the odor issues until mid-March. At that point, the vapors had been in the building for, you know, at least a month and a half before students even knew that this was happening. Um, and so it seems like the university has recognized that and they're doing things, um, you know, to make that better. But on some other points, they, um, you know, wouldn't talk so much. So I asked them, for instance, you know, who's being held accountable for this? Obviously, there were mistakes made. And they were saying, you know, as an institution, they'll take the blame, but um, they're not gonna, you know, be firing anybody at this point. And that's something that a lot of people have been skeptical about. And the uh, overall cost uh, on this project after this uh, big setback? So the initial amount that this project was supposed to cost was around $2 million to just update the building and renovate the roof. Um, but then after all of this stuff happened, um, they're gonna be spending another up to $12 million on the building. So that's gonna be, that's going to include some outstanding renovations. Like I mentioned, there have been issues that have been persisting in the building for over 20 years. So they're gonna be addressing some of that. And then after all this drama with the roof, they're gonna be spending $2.5 million to install a completely new roof on the building. So. It'll be nice for people who have worked in the building for a long time, but you know it's going to be a while before it's back to normal. Okay, maybe not by the time uh, school starts here. And... Definitely not. So at this point, um, there aren't going to be any classes in the building next semester. Um, the building is open. I've been in there a few times, and it's definitely under construction. Um, the only classes that'll be there are a few biology labs, but they're saying now that the building's going to be put out of regular use for up to two years. So it's going to be a while before things are back to normal okay. again. Well, really good story, very interesting. We're gonna move on now. Well, this tot is cute, but hardly little, over 220 pounds and not even three weeks old. Not surprisingly, it's a rhinoceros that we're talking about. Its name is Edward. His birth is beyond special. And Eric, explain why the conception and birth of this particular rhino at the San Diego Zoo made news worldwide. Well, this is only the second rhino on the planet to have been conceived artificially using a frozen sperm sample. Um, and it's part of this big overall program that the San Diego Zoo has uh, to try to help a related subspecies. Now, uh, Edward, which is the young one's name, and his mom, Victoria, uh, mom Victoria was uh, artificially inseminated back in March of 2018. She's carried him for 490 days uh, before giving birth a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and he's very healthy, he's very rambunctious, uh, he's doing everything that a, a rhino his age should do. But uh, Victoria is a southern white rhino, and there are five other southern white rhinos in this off exhibit area at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. And they will eventually, hopefully, be surrogates for a southern black, or not a southern black rhino, but a northern uh, white rhino. Uh, northern white rhinos, there are only two left on the planet. They both live in Kenya right now. Um, and they will likely um, pass on, uh, die before this recovery effort gets underway. So it may end up being a case where a species goes extinct for a few years and then this program will help kind of bring it back. Victoria is intended to be a surrogate for a northern white embryo, 
that they would implant in her. Um, the other five uh, females that are back there uh, are intended uh, to be the same thing as well. All right, we've got a clip here I want to uh, play. You interviewed uh, Barbara Durant, Zoo's chief re uh, reproductive uh, physiologist. Here's what she had to say uh, how important Victoria has become. The other important thing about this pregnancy is that now we know that Victoria is what we call a proven female. So she, we know she can conceive, she can carry a fetus to term, she can give birth and she can take care of it. That's really important for us because in the future, Victoria and the other girls here at the Rhino Rescue Center are going to be surrogates for northern white rhino embryos that will be transferred into them for gestation. So we have to know that they're capable of carrying those rhinos to birth. And the zoo hoping to celebrate another rare birth soon. Uh, there is another rhino there that is pregnant right now, Amani. She's expecting sometime in November. Um, they're actively trying to get two more of those rhinos pregnant through artificial insemination. Once uh, a female has gotten pregnant through artificial insemination, they're going to try embryo implantation with a southern white embryo. And if both of those pregnancies work, then they figure that they're candidates for embryo implantation with a northern white rhino, which is much more rare. I, I should say there's a, par a parallel project going on at the same time. They're trying to figure out what the protocols are for creating uh, uh, sperm and eggs from skin cell samples that they have that are frozen, northern white skin cell samples. Um, and that's going on concurrently with, with, with this physical effort uh, at the safari park. When those two processes converge, uh, it might be good news for the northern white rhino. All right, now this is this very hopeful news from the San Diego uh, uh, Zoo and the Safari Park comes during a week when the Trump administration is uh, kind of dealing a, a death blow. They're kind of gutting the uh, the uh, Endangered Species Act. Explain what, what happened this week. Yeah, the Trump administration issued some new rules this week about how uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service will go about determining whether a species is threatened or endangered, and then what happens as a result of that threatened or endangered species uh, designation. Right now, if a species is found to be threatened or endangered based solely on, on biological issues, scientific issues, both the threatened and the endangered will get uh, habitat protection, um, uh, sweeping habitat protection. On the federal lands, right. they would, yeah. Sure. Uh, the Trump administration wants to uh, remove that from the threatened species, not give them the same level of prote protection. And they also want to include something else. They want the Fish and Wildlife Service to come up with an economic analysis to see what what impact it would have uh, if you designate a species as critically endangered. Um, and they can't really make a decision because the law says you can't make a decision based on economics. Uh, but the Fish and Wildlife Service will have to go through this process. And there is fear that once they do that, and that's part of the discussion, it will have an influence on the final decision. And the idea here is to open federal lands to more uh, commercial interests, like uh, mining and drilling. And It's not what they said explicitly when they were talking about the rule changes, but other people have looked at this and they've said, yeah. yeah. Clearly, every story about it's put sure. that context in, sure. right? Yeah. Matt? I know you've been covering this for a long time. How did, how did we get here? I mean, is it like poaching that endangered these rhinos? And then how long... I mean, are these rhinos going to stay at the zoo, or are they going to put them back in the wild eventually? Or? Um, uh, good, good questions. Uh, how they got here, uh, it's a combination of poaching and war. Um, in their natural habitat is the Congo, where they're m most common in the wild, or they were most common in the wild. Um, they were poached uh, pretty aggressively, and then the, the effort to try to stop that poaching was hampered by the fact that that region has been under a civil war for for many, many years. So uh, they just got to the edge. Uh, where does it go? The, the idea, what, what researchers uh, want to do is to be able to create a self-sustaining herd of northern white rhinos. Wow. Whether that's in captivity or out in the wild, I think that question still remains to be seen, but they want to have a herd of northern white rhinos that can reproduce on their own. They have enough genetic diversity uh, to do so. Now, the Endangered Species Act, that had strong bipartisan support signed by a Republican president decades ago. Uh, how uh, effective has it been? It's pretty darn effective. Even the U.S. symbol of the bald eagle has been protected. Symbol of the bald eagle, no longer on the endangered species list because it was successfully recovered. We have eagles here in San Diego County because uh, of the work that was done into that. So you can make the, the case that it was very successful in what it's done. And what it basically did was it set a standard. It said, look, you have to... If this species is threatened, you have to do what you can to protect it and to make sure that it thrives moving forward. And with the United Nations report out saying that we lose, stand, you know, we're on the precipice of losing 
a million more species, uh, it doesn't seem like the timing is very good to try to pull back some of those protections under U.S. law. And it's a uh, particularly uh, uh, precarious time. A U.N. study just released in May said uh, extinction rates are just going off the charts now compared to the last 10 million years that have been studied. Sure. One, one thing that I think is also important to note in the rules that were issued this week by the Trump administration, uh, it, they're not, they're, they don't look backward. So any species that's already protected or already enjoying protections will enjoy those protections. It's just moving forward. And of course, they have been challenged. The state of California has challenged them uh, legally. Uh, there are some who think that, that these uh, rule changes are not legal because the Endangered Species Act says specifically in the language of the law that you can't use an economic analysis to make a determination. Um, and, and so those things will be challenged in court. All right, so we're out of time, but uh, we'll look forward to see what happens with those challenges moving forward. And that does wrap up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Matt Hoffman of KPBS News, Eric Anderson also of KPBS News, and Bella Ross of iNewsource, our partner. And a reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today, and join us again next week on The Roundtable. <music>